Hey there, AP Environmental Science class. All right, welcome back to part two of my lecture on chapter 13, Water Resources. We left off in the previous uh, part, part one, talking about how dams, uh, how dams, there are kind of good parts, uh, good things about dams, but also some negative uh, environmental consequences from, from damming rivers. Uh, so what we're going to now uh, talk about is kind of transition uh, into how dams kill an estuary. So we mentioned this before in part one uh, in talking about the Colorado River, which again is in the west uh, western part of the U.S. The Colorado River empties into the Gulf of California. Uh, if you know Mexico, we got the Baja Peninsula and then the main part of Mexico, and then in the, kind of between them two is the Gulf of California. That's where the Colorado River empties into. And as of now, only small amounts of water actually reach the Gulf of California from the Colorado River because of all the dams that have been built along the Colorado River. Uh, so that has actually, a lot, as you go all the way downstream, only a trickle of water now enters the Gulf of California. So this threatens aquatic species in the river and species that live in the estuary. Remember, the estuary is kind of that middle ground between the river and the ocean, kind of brackish, brinish type of water, some fresh water, some salt water mixing in there. That's your estuary. So with not enough fresh water getting into the estuary, obviously this is threatening the aquatic species that live in the freshwater river, but also the species that live in the brackish water uh, in that estuary. Current rate of river withdrawal, again, this is from the Colorado River, is not sustainable. So we need to figure out a different way uh, for the folks in the uh, American Southwest to irrigate their crops and to, uh, and to have uh, fresh water for drinking. Uh, and again, one of the issues is the inefficient use of irrigation water Water for agriculture. Again, this kind of goes back to uh, the previous chapter about industrialized agriculture and how there is uh, uh, an inefficient uh, use of irrigation, uh, of, of too much irrigation. A lot of times uh, uh, leads to too much salt, right? Salinization uh, in the in the soil. All right, but it's also depleting our aquifers and uh, depleting uh, the water that comes from the Colorado River. So, uh, some proposed actions. For states using the Colorado River to potentially help alleviate some of these issues, well, they can enact strict converse, uh, co conservation uh, measures. They can phase out agricultural subsidies. Again, it all a lot of times comes back to money, right? So if you phase out some of these subsidies, uh, the agricultural folks uh, will have to change their practices. You can shift those water thirsty crops to less arid areas. We spoke about this in part one. Uh, certain crops tend to need more water than others, so uh, don't grow crops that need a lot of water in an area that doesn't have a lot of water. Okay, that doesn't make any sense. And of course, we've spoke about this a few times already uh, in this chapter, raise the price of fresh water, because if the price is, uh, is increased, then it may cause folks to waste less, okay? Because if you're, uh, if you're just throwing money down the drain, okay, uh, the uh, quote unquote, uh, the proverbial drain, uh, obviously um, people, obviously when they start losing money, uh, start to change their habits. In 2014, the Moralo Stam, which is near Yuma, Arizona, actually opened for two months to release water through the Delta into the Gulf of California. This was kind of a, 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 a remediation method here. And believe it or not, there were some dramatic dramatic short-term results, which were in the positive. Uh, so obviously it just shows us that uh, that water needs to continue uh, to uh, flow down the, the uh, Colorado River uh, into the Gulf of, of, of California, okay? Because without it, unfortunately, we are killing, uh, killing that estuary. And again, if it's happening there, it's happening all over the world uh, where you have rivers being dammed. Uh, there's a critical concept real quick. It talks about uh, the National Environmental Policy Act and environmental impact statements. So so uh, the Envi uh, National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, requires that an environmental impact statement be developed for every federal project likely to have an effect on e on uh, effect have an effect on the environmental quality. And this would mean impacts on water, soil, air quality, wildlife, habitat, etc. So not only water, uh, but for uh, everything. And this is done. Uh, this is done here. Uh, here in, in Westchester County when uh, when uh, new development is being done. So just something to keep in the back of your mind. All right, so what we're now going to talk about is how... So we spoke about how there's so very little fresh water available on this planet, but what we have an abundance of is salt water. So 
what folks have discussed is the process of taking salt water and turning it into fresh water. Uh, one country, Saudi Arabia, happens to do this. Uh, they're actually the leaders in this right now. Um, and this what's known as desalinization methods or, or desalinization, taking salt out of the water. Unfortunately, one of the big issues right now with this desalinization is that it is very expensive. Okay, and it's not, uh, it doesn't uh, produce that much fresh water. So that's the issues right now. But this is a kind of growing uh, area of environmental science. So maybe one of you, if you're interested in this, this could be something that you do as a career, uh, maybe go into uh, environmental science and maybe find a cheaper and more effective way to take salt water and turn it into fresh water desalinization. Because again, we have plenty of salt water on this planet. Uh, and if we can figure out a cheap and fast way to turn that uh, salt water into fresh water, then we may be able to alleviate uh, a lot of those fresh water concerns uh, that we have. So desalinization methods, there are two that are, are basically used, something called distil distilization distillation and reverse osmosis. So more than 17,000 desalination plants are currently operating in 150 countries. So they are out there. Uh, most of them, again, in arid nations like the Middle East, North Africa, Caribbean, and the Mediterranean uh, Sea area. And again, Saudi Arabia is the leader uh, in this right now. However, what are our issues? We just spoke about it. High cost, okay? You need a lot of energy, which again adds to the cost and adds to potentially other uh, other environmental degradation issues. And you need large amounts of, of salty uh, 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 wastewater, okay, in order in order to do this. So those are some of the issues, all right? But this is basically how it's done. So on the left is your revo uh, reverse osmosis. So what happens uh, in reverse osmosis? Well, basically you have pressure, all right, that's A here, pressure pushing down, you have all this water. B is a semi-permeable membrane. What does that mean? Well, semi-permeable means only some things can go through it, right? So what can go through it? Fresh water. What can't go through that B, that semi-permeable membrane? Salt. So what happens is, as the pressure pushes down, that's your A here, it pushes water through B, which is your semi-permeable membrane, the salt, which can't get through that membrane, is left behind, and then that salt exits out this pipe C, okay, that's your kind of salt water. D, obviously, is your fresh water that then moves out uh, area D and then can be used for irrigation or for drinking, all right? So this is reverse osmosis, again, using a semi-permeable membrane to separate salt water, at least the salt, to separate the salt from the water. All right, so the salt stays on one side of the membrane, the fresh water gets to the other side, and there you have fresh water. So that is a reverse osmosis. In distillation, okay, this involves heating water. So you have A here, which heats the water. The water turns into gas. Well, what's interesting is that when you heat water, the water evaporates, but the salt does not evaporate. So basically, the salt is left behind in whatever uh, water you have left over. Uh, you have evaporation. Then that uh, evaporated water, that water vapor, condenses... Okay, that's what you see here in B, condenses along these coils, which are cold, to allow for the condensation. And then they almost uh, form like its own own type of rainstorm in this tank, in this in this uh, distillation tank, okay? It, it kind of rains fresh water, and then you collect that fresh water, uh, and that goes out here. E is your briny, your salty wastewater, and then you could actually collect that and use that for some other things as well. This is the way, if you are, if you, I remember way back in when I was young, Gilligan's Island I used to watch. And one of the ways that Gilligan on the island was able to get fresh water was this, using distillation. He had the professor right there and he kind of knew what he was doing. Uh, and I remember thinking to myself, if I was ever lost or abandoned on a, on a desert island somewhere in the ocean, this is how you could get fresh water. What you could do is take your water maybe hollow out a coconut, okay, and put the water in a coconut, somehow light a fire, okay, get that water in the coconut to evaporate, somehow have some kind of a, a saran wrap, or again, I don't know how you can find this if you're abandoned on a desert island, but maybe, maybe you're lucky, something that is cooler than the surrounding air as that water vapor comes up, it condenses, now you have fresh water, and then you could collect that fresh water uh, 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 to drink, okay, called distillation, all right? So that's, uh, again, 
two processes that can remove salt from seawater. And again, you're going to want to use distillation if you're yourself abandoned on a, on a desert island somewhere, okay? <laughs> that would be a way uh, to get yourself some fresh water. But it works, all right? So these are two, uh, two types of steps uh, that, are, that are used. Um, and again, just understand both of them and understand that right now uh, they're all expensive. They're not as efficient, uh, but they are being done. And uh, the hope is down the road that we can get uh, these processes to work a little better because, again, we do have plenty of salt water out there. Another idea is transferring water from one location to another. So can we transfer, uh, can we transfer water to expand water supply? So transferring water from one place to another has greatly increased water supplies in some areas, but it also has disrupted ecosystems. So water transfers are going to have benefits and are going to have drawbacks as with everything here in environmental science, right? So in China, uh, the South North Water Diversion Project was implemented. Uh, it actually diverts 6 trillion gallons of water per year uh, from the south to the north, okay, from where they have a lot of water to an area where they don't have another water. Uh, the California Central Valley uses aqueducts, Okay, two uh, aqueducts are what? Aqueducts are above ground. Uh, in the old the Roman days, they were open. Now they're just pipes that basically pump water uh, into other areas. Uh, water loss, however, happens through evaporation and leaks uh, with these aqueducts. All right, so um, you again, it's not as, it's not an efficient, it's not a totally efficient water transfer because of that. And also, you're going to have ecosystem uh, ecosystem degradation, right? You're, if you take water from one area, put it to an area where there's not a lot of water. Well, guess what? That area where there's not a lot of water, maybe the uh, the ecosystem there has developed to not deal with water. Now, all of a sudden, you give it water, you're going to have issues. And then, of course, the area where you're taking the water away, obviously, you're degrading the ecosystems there. So, again, always uh, there are some benefits, obviously, getting water from uh, an area where they have plenty to an area where they have none. That's a benefit. But, obviously, you're losing some of that water. It's not a totally efficient transfer. And, obviously, you're having some uh, issues with the ecosystem as well. So, this is just a picture of uh, California. Here's your aqueduct systems. Again, pumping that water from the Colorado River inland. Uh, here you pump the water up from, uh, this is actually uh, the Sierra Nevada mountains. It gets kind of wettish in here. You could pump some of that water. All right. And again, the uh, Sacramento River, uh, San Joaquin River here, pumping some of that water out. And again, moving the water into different areas. See the arrows uh, where they are going. Okay. Coming down this way uh, and moving into the more populated areas of LA, San Diego, San Francisco, Santa Barbara, etc. All right. So one of these, uh, one case study uh, in the Aral Sea, which this is over in uh, the Caucasus, okay, which is uh, in the area of Eastern, uh, Eastern Europe, Western Russia, okay, uh, they did a large scale water transfer, okay, in dry Central Asia. All right. So this is kind of, this is kind of right between where Europe and kind of Asia meet. Okay. Uh, but this, so what they did was they basically uh, have this aerial sea and they took water out of the sea and moved it to other places that they didn't have water. And uh, they, it led to some severe problems. First one was the wetland destruction. You actually had desertification occur uh, in and around the, the, the aerial sea. Uh, greatly increased salinity. So when you're taking fresh water out of the sea, all right, this is one of those inland seas that did have some salt to it. Uh, when you take more of the fresh water out, you leave more of the salt water behind. And though that increased the salt water of the of the Aral Sea, uh, turned it into kind of like the uh, Dead Sea in uh, in uh, Israel um, or on the uh, 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 the border there. Um, so uh, again, it, it, it's 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 a problem. Fish extinctions and decline of fishing in the sea, as obviously you lost water and you increased the salinity, obviously changed the ecosystem and uh, it's. Uh, fish that lived with a certain type of, uh, had a tolerance, right, with a, turn, a certain type of salinity. Now you increase the salinity, uh, those fish can't tolerate it anymore, and they die off. Blowing salt and dust, destroying wildlife and crops. So now you have this sea that used to have water. It is now dry. There's salt uh, residue all over the place. Then you get wind to blow in, and it blows that salt and dust onto neighboring areas and kills wildlife and crops, and it actually increased the glacial melting in the 
Himalayas. Uh, shrinkage of the Aral Sea has altered local climate. Hot, dry summers, colder winters, and a shortened growing season now occurs around the sea. Uh, restoration efforts, they've tried uh, cooperation from neighboring countries. Uh, they've tried more efficient irrigation. They've tried to put in a dike uh, construction to raise the level of the northern uh, northern sea there. Uh, but it's, uh, it's a long process to restore it. It's always a lot easier to destroy the environment than it is to restore the environment. And let me show you a dramatic picture, all right? This is an absolutely dramatic picture on the left, the Aral Sea from 1976, and on the right, the Aral Sea just about six years ago in 2015. You kidding me? This is what we as humans can do. We took water out of it, and what are we left with? Look at this whiteness here. That's all salt residue. Okay, it's totally dry. There's really no parts of this sea even left. Okay, and obviously whatever wetland ecosystems, whatever aquatic ecosystems you had here are totally gone, totally gone now because of, of, of them, of these folks taking the water diversion, taking the water out of the Aral Sea, moving it somewhere else to hopefully help irrigate and, and plant crops. And what you end up doing is not only destroying the Aral Sea, but again, you now have wind blowing this dust and this salty residue all around here. So any crops you tried to grow around the Aral Sea can't grow now either. So unfortunately, this was a uh, more of a lose-lose situation uh, than a win-win situation here. And again, just a dramatic example uh, of the problems of, uh, of, defer or of transferring water. Okay, while it may work in some instances, in many instances it doesn't, and it totally destroys ecosystems. So with all that in mind, how can we use fresh water more sustainably, all right? Well, that's obviously the key as we head through uh, the next 50 to 100 years. So ways to use fresh water more sustainably, cut water waste, raise water prices. We've spoke about this before. Obviously, slow, pop, uh, slow population growth, uh, protect aquifers, forests, and other ecosystems that store and release fresh water. What you're kind of understanding is that a lot of these uh, we spoke about at the beginning of the of this course how the ecosystem, uh, the Earth's uh, ecosystem, all is, is is all connected. Well, you'll notice a lot of the stuff in environmental science is all connected, right? Uh, raise water prices, uh, same thing. Uh, you know, we raise mineral prices that'll help people not 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 use minerals. The slow population growth works for works for obviously for food, works for uh, water, works for uh, other types of environmental issues. So again, you're noticing that a lot of the same kind of things that we can do uh, to sustain one topic can be used to to sustain the other uh, and in this case we're, we're talking about uh, talking about fresh water uh, one half to two-thirds of water is wasted think about that 50 to 66 percent of water is wasted through evaporation leaks and inefficient use so obviously if we can just Look, if we can just cut half of the waste, right? If we can take 50%, uh, cut it to 25%, it's still wasteful, but it's still much better than we're doing now. Once again, the cost of water to users is low. Government subsidies mask the true cost of water. So no subsidies for improved water efficiency. Maybe we need to come in with uh, some subsidies that, uh, that, that, that give people tax breaks if they use water more efficiently. Uh, and maybe we need to raise the, the, the cost of water. Again, my water bill is always the lowest compared to my electric and my gas bill. And I would argue I probably use more water in my house than I use electric or gas. So at the end of the day, if that water price was increased and my water bill goes from 50 a month to 200 a month, well, you could probably hear Mr. Van Eck saying, turn that phone it off or turn that water off when you're brushing your teeth, right? Which you're supposed to do. Right now, I don't. I'll be honest because water is cheap. So uh, obviously, uh, what could we do? Raise the price of water. Uh, raising prices, though, could hurt lower income farmers and city, uh, city dwellers. Uh, so again, this is kind of the yin and the yang. While folks like me and you might be able to handle a little bit of an increase in our water, uh, maybe some folks who are not doing as well as us might not be able to handle that. So again, this is where you have to kind of balance that out. Uh, the solution, uh, establish lifeline rates. 
Okay, so lifeline rates uh, could be something uh, that could go over the course uh, of a lifetime or something like that. That could be a solution that could maybe help uh, the lower lower income farmers and the and the city dwellers. We can improve efficiency in irrigation. So this is a big issue. Again, uh, uh, flood irrigation, 45% of water is lost. All right, when you do a type of what's known as flood irrigation, which is basically just, just flooding a field and letting the water sink through, well, you're only using 55% of the water the rest of it is lost so that's a that's a waste right uh, more efficient techniques and we'll talk about this uh, a little bit more something called a center pivot low pressure sprinkler uh, low energy precision application sprinklers or a drip or trickle irrigation otherwise called micro irrigation uh, that is a little costly but uh, much less water waste there. So what are we talking about uh, when we talk about this? Basically, here we go. So on the left side, that's your gravity flow. That's your kind of flooded uh, irrigation type of system. Uh, water usually comes from an aqueduct system or a nearby river. All right, you kind of flood the fields here and then let the water sink in, a way of irrigation, just call it gravity flow, uh, flow again, percolation or perme, uh, you know, uh, infiltration into the ground, the water, but it's only 60 to 80% efficient. There's your drip irrigation, which is actually the most efficient, 90 to 95%. Basically, you just have above or below ground pipes uh, PVC piping and you just put little holes in the pipes. So these pipes are along the ground and basically the water just drip, 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 drips out of the pipes. Okay. Uh, and so what happens here is what the reason why the gravity flow, you lose a lot of water is a lot of the water gets run, either runs off or, or just goes to where the roots of the plants or you're trying to irrigate, can't use them here with the drip irrigation. It's such a slow process that the soil is able to handle it very well. It's able to get, get into the soil. The root systems are able to, to suck it up, suck the water up and use the water. So again, it's this very, it works very well. Unfortunately, it is expensive. Uh, right now, uh, but again, uh, it's efficiency up near 95%. The last one is that center pivot with an Aleppo sprinkler. That is a low uh, energy precision application type sprinkler. Uh, and basically efficiency 80%. With a low pressure sprinkler, if you go with the low uh, precision application, low energy, meaning they're precisely uh, putting it where it needs to be, the water, you can get up to 95 cent uh, efficiency here. Uh, water usually pumped from underground and sprayed from a uh, mobile boom with sprinklers. So something that you're seeing right here. Okay. So these are three ways that we can improve uh, efficiency in irrigation, uh, which again is a big way area where we, where we uh, waste a lot of fresh water. So again, just have a general idea of these three ways uh, uh, and briefly be able uh, to, to, to explain them if you have to on an FRQ. So some solutions again, reducing irrigation water loss, avoid growing thirsty crops in dry areas. Again, we've spoke about that. Import water intensive uh, crops and meat. Encourage organic farming and polyculture to retain soil moisture. Again, this goes back to the previous unit, right? The organic farming, the polyculture, having more than one type of uh, having more than one type of crop. You have all soybeans for uh, eyes to see. That's monoculture. Well, that's going to uh, decrease soil moisture. You have different types of, of plants growing together. Well, then the uh, soil moisture is, is is retained more efficiently. Monitor that soil moisture to add water only when necessary. Don't over irrigate. Expand that use of drip irrigation and the other uh, efficiency methods that we just spoke about. Irrigate at night to reduce evaporation. That's that's key. Uh, if you ever wonder why uh, folks water their lawns in the morning and in the evening, uh, it's because you get less evaporation. If you water your lawn midday when the sun is out, it's the hottest part of the day. A lot of that water is evaporating before it soaks into the ground. You're, you're, the, uh, the grass can't even use it. So, so either do it at night or again, do it in the early mornings or, or, or in the late evenings. Line canals that bring water to irrigation ditches, line them so that the water doesn't infiltrate and get and loot and leave the canals and not actually being used end up being used for irrigation uh, and irrigate with treated wastewater so that's another idea you have this wastewater maybe from uh from um from waste plants, waste management plants. We'll talk about that in a couple of units, but you can actually take that wastewater, treat it to make it uh, to make it drinkable or usable, uh, and then you can, or actually not to drink, 
let me let me check that you're not going to drink a treated wastewater but you can definitely irrigate with treated wastewater so take that wastewater that maybe comes from a, a from a from 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 a from a factory or from a plant or from a again a, a, a septic uh, a system where you're taking uh you know human waste and, and and dealing with it okay take that wastewater treat it and then you can actually use that water for for irrigation and leave the real fresh water uh, uh for people to actually drink so again just some solutions uh, that we can help uh, approve, improve the efficiency in our irrigation. Now, what's interesting is that poor farmers conserve more water than rich farmers because they use low-tech methods. Again, this is back to that traditional farming we spoke about. Uh, Human-powered uh, treadle, uh, treadle pumps bring water into irrigation ditches. I'll show you a picture of that in just a second. Uh, they harvest and they store rainwater. So when rainwater comes from the ground, from the sky, they actually harvest it and store it. They capture water from fog. Right? What is fog? Just water vapor on the ground. So they actually capture that water and they use polyculture to create canopy vegetation, which reduces evaporation. So if you, again, polyculture more than one type of crop, but you can actually create canopy vegetation that goes over your land right, and that reduces the evaporation of the soil, keeping your soil more moist reducing the amount of water that you need to use for irrigation. So here are one of those special pumps uh, that the poor farmers use, okay? They do it by hand and they pump the water up into those little uh, little irrigation uh, uh, canals that then go around their, their crops and irrigate their crops. But the point is, by doing the pumping by hand, you're not depleting the aquifers because you're not pulling up water so quickly uh, as you would do with, a, with a, you know, a machine pump. And obviously, eventually the human gets tired. And so it's more of a natural process. It's more of a, a sustainable process than just having an automatic pump just sucking water up out of the aquifer 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Okay. So again, it, it, it's kind of weird, but we kind of got to go back to the old school, right? Go back to the more traditional farm because back then we didn't have these water uh, conservation issues. Cutting freshwater losses in industry and homes obviously is our next step, okay, uh, in a uh, next area that we can look at to help conserve fresh water. So recycle water you, uh, used in industry, uh, use low flow toilets, shower heads, and front loading washing machines, all right? So um, the shower head's a big thing. Uh, those of, I definitely have one of those, uh, one of those uh, kind of low flow shower heads uh, that you can install. They save a lot of water. Uh, fix leaks in the plumbing system because uh, much of our water loss is due to just leaks. Use native plants in landscaping. Why would you want to use native plants? Because native plants can deal with the natural native environment and the native climate. What a lot of people tend to do is bring in these beautiful plants to landscape their lawns that don't really belong in, let's say, in Ardsley. Uh, so maybe they come; these plants come in and they need so much more water than most of the normal plants that, that grow around here uh, 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 naturally. And so now you have to water your plants more than you would more more than you would normally because they're not native to this area and they need more water than naturally occurs well that's an issue so just use pl native plants and landscaping that can that can handle the amount of water received maybe you live in california you don't receive a lot of water well if you use native plants those native plants have adapted to not have to use a lot of water okay so things the uh, things that you could do in your landscaping uh use gray water uh and use water meters uh, to reduce water use, okay. Water meters help reduce it because you see how much uh, you see how much water you are using, okay, and uh, it causes you to stop because you know you're being you're being charged for it. So here again, just a, a picture of some beautiful uh, landscaping in this area. Looks like a. Oh, you know, see some palm trees. So maybe it could be Florida, South Carolina, it could be California. But the point is, you'll notice what are they using? cacti right obviously don't need a lot of water it doesn't seem like there's a lot of water in this area so they're planting plants here that don't need a lot of water which is good because you're not going to get a lot of water in this area all right so again make sure to uh to plant those native plants uh, in your landscaping so more solutions for reducing water loss in industry and homes redesign manufacturing processes to use less water again recycle water fix water leaks landscape yards with plants that require a little water use drip irrigation on gardens and lawns so i know i have my 
sprinkler system that kind of goes back and forth. Maybe I should install a bit of a drip irrigation system. Use water-saving shower heads, faucets, appliance, and toilets. Or waterless composting toilets. I haven't gone there yet, but that could be uh, that could be interesting. Collect and reuse gray water in and around houses, apartments, and office buildings. Okay, uh, and also raise water prices and use meters, especially in dry dry urban areas uh, where you need to keep a, a more of a count on how much fresh water is being used. All right, using less water to remove waste. Large amounts of fresh water used to flush away waste. Reuse that wastewater. Again, we spoke about this. Only about 7% of wastewater is currently recycled, but if it is recycled and treated, okay, you can use it to irrigate crops, uh, and it gives us a lot more of a, a lot more water uh, resources here, again, to irrigate those crops, and then you can leave that other fresh water uh, aside uh, for people to drink. And of course, use waterless com composting toilets, similar to the compost in my backyard. You just let the kind of uh, your 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 um, your waste kind of sit there and decay. Not sure I want that in my house yet, but maybe you guys will come up with a way to have a composting toilet in your house that uh, maybe is a little more clean, for instance. So again, maybe that could be something uh, that 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 you uh, that you invent. Okay, down down the road. All right, so using water more sustainably, again, just more ways to protect water supplies, apply strate strategies at the local, regional, national, and international levels, uh, and apply strategies at the personal level as well. Again, use fr less fresh water and use it more efficiently. We can, all, we can all do our part. So what can we do? Again, a lot of this we've spoke about, okay? Just kind of have a few of these in the back of your mind, just in case you need to write it on an FRQ. Use water-saving toilets, shower heads, faucets. Take Take short showers instead of baths. Turn off sink faucets while brushing teeth, shaving, and washing. We've all we've all heard uh, heard those those uh, campaigns before. Wash only full loads of clothes, or use the lowest possible water level setting for smaller loads. That's in when you wash your clothes. Repair those leaks. Wash your car from a bucket of soapy water. Uh, or use gray water, which is just basically uh, basically uh, uh, water that is captured, okay? Or use the hose for rinsing only. If you use a commercial car wash, try to find one that recycles its water. Replace your lawn with native plants that need little, if any, watering. Water lawns and gardens only in the morning or evening, okay? Or use that gray water again. Or again, you can use that drip irrigation and mulch for gardens and flower beds also. So again, just have a couple of these in mind uh, in case you need to... Uh, put them on an FRQ. How can we reduce the threat of flooding? I believe this is the last section here. So we can lessen the threat of flooding by protecting more wetlands and natural vegetation and watersheds because they naturally uh, help protect from flooding. And don't build in areas subject to frequent flooding. That sounds pretty, uh, pretty self-explanatory there, right? Uh, floodplain is an area flooded when a stream overflows its channel. So again, just a uh, just some terms here. Uh, this section talks about uh, how areas, some areas get too much water. Uh, so an area floodplain is the area flooded when a stream overflows its channel. Uh, very fertile soil for, soil for farming, however, so that's kind of a positive of the flooding. And it also recharges the groundwater and refills the wetland. So for instance, the Nile River, right? Uh, the Egyptians were able to uh, flourish there because every uh, once in a while on a natural cycle, the, uh, the, uh, the river would flood and that actually uh, refertilizes the farming area around the floods uh, and actually recharges the groundwater and, and actually helps out with the environment. Uh, but human activities damage floodplains. So we remove vegetation and we drain wetlands and then that unfortunately uh, causes the positives that we get from some flooding to end up a turning negative. Negative. Uh, rising sea levels from global warming means more coastal flooding. And again, coastal flooding we don't want because coastal flooding is saltwater flooding. And when your salt water gets into your aquifers or any inland freshwater, well, then you contaminate that freshwater. Okay. So we don't want that. But unfortunately, uh, our rising uh, global warming obviously uh, is causing sea levels to rise, which is going to mean more flooding. So uh, also, we spoke about this a couple of chapters ago when we talked about uh, runoff and how after deforestation, you unfortunately get more flooding. So uh, forested hill 
side, uh, evapotranspiration uh, evaporates a lot of the water. Tree roots stabilize the soil. You have a diverse ecological habitat. Trees reduce soil erosion from heavy wind and rain, and vegetation releases water slowly and reduces flooding. Over here, where you have uh, deforestation, you get these gullies and these landslides, heavy rain quickly erodes the topsoil, evapotranspiration decreases, overgrazing accelerates the soil erosion by water or wind, winds remove the topsoil, agricultural land is flooded and silted up or, or excess silt added on top of it. Uh, you got silt from erosion fills rivers and reservoirs, rapid runoff causes flooding. So again, it's all kind of connected here, folks. Okay, uh, again, this is going back to a couple of chapters ago. But again, it talks about flooding, you deforest an area, you're going to potentially lead to more flooding uh, than a nice forested hillside uh, uh, would have. So a case study here, living dangerously on the floodplains in Bangladesh, dense population there on the coastal floodplain, moderate flood maintains the fertile soil that they need. However, there's been a recent increase uh, frequency of severe floods, uh, and that has caused the destruction of the coastal wetlands, or at least not only that, but the humans. Mangrove forests have been cleared. That, of course, increases flooding, uh, which increases your storm damage because those mangrove forests are, are a nice, uh, uh, their ecological service, again, is to block uh, block those, uh, those, that, those the, the storm surge kind of coming in from the ocean. So obviously those uh, folks are getting rid of the mangrove forest to plant or to maybe live, and that's increasing the severity of the floods. Uh, and adopting a means using more flood tolerant crops. We need to find crops that, are, that can handle flooding. Believe it or not, most plants can handle drought better than they can handle flooding. I see that in my uh, in my own garden that I that I grow. If I overwater my garden, my plants wilt. If I underwater the garden, the plants have a lot easier of a time. Uh, surviving. If I happen to uh, not water for a week or so, the plants will start to wilt a little bit. But the minute I water, boom, they're perfect again. If I overwater. Uh, the plants start to kind of get a little wilty and they really never come back, unfortunately. So uh, overwatering much, much worse uh, than, than uh, underwatering crops. Uh, rely more on nature's system. So again, this is a, how to reduce flood risk. Uh, these are your wetlands, your natural vegetation in those watersheds. All right. And rely less on engineering devices. Rely less on dams, levees, and channelized streams to reduce your flooding. Again, rely more on the natural ecosystem system services that are out there uh, to help us prevent flooding. So once again, uh, solutions on how we can reduce flood damage. This is our last slide. Uh, prevention, preserve forest and watersheds, all right, to help prevent the deforestation, that uh, hillside without any trees on it. Preserve and restore wetlands tax development on floodplains and increased use of floodplains for sustainable agricultural and forestry, control, strengthen and deepen streams, all right, channelization is what that called, build levees or flood walls along the streams, and of course you can help, help you can build dams uh, to help control uh, flood damage, but then obviously uh, other uh, issues occur uh, when you do build those dams, all right? So as a result, always in uh, environmental science, there's some good things and there are some bad things that come out of everything. Uh, so make sure you just have an understanding of each. All right. So that concludes chapter 13 on water resources. I hope you enjoyed. And as always, thanks for listening.